please be advised that some scenes in the following program are of a mature nature, and some parents may not wish their young children to view them. Major funding for Frontline is provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Additional funding is provided by this station and other public television stations nationwide. Tonight on Frontline, street gangs. One man fights back and starts a war. I'm not going to leave you. You know, let them know somebody got to stand up. Now they going to run me away from here? No way. Yeah, well, I'll leave. I'll leave you in the box. Mr. Hawkins' son blew away one of the gang members. They are going to not be satisfied until they get somebody from the Hawkins family. A frightening modern-day reality. Warning from gangland. From the network of public television stations, a presentation of KCTS Seattle, WNET New York, WPBT Miami, WTVS Detroit, and WGBH Boston. This is Frontline. Good evening, I'm Judy Woodruff. Tonight, a story which sounds like the plot of a Western movie. A shopkeeper fighting to protect his turf. A shootout, murder charges, death threats. But it's not a Western. It's about a modern-day urban reality, street gang violence, and the effect it has on the lives of ordinary citizens. Our story is about a man named James Hawkins. He's 72 years old and runs a grocery store in the Watts section of Los Angeles, right in the middle of the largest concentration of street gangs in the country. Hawkins has been called a hero, the good guy in this drama, standing up against a street gang that has declared war on him and his family. But modern good guys are more complex than their Wild West counterparts, and so are the bad guys. And as usual, in real life, nothing is as simple as it seems. The film is called Warning from Gangland. It is produced by Robert Drew. Call it the Southland. Call it the City of Angels. Half the urban area of Los Angeles County is staked out by street gangs. Los Angeles gangs are turning more and more to murder for profit, murder to control citizens and to silence witnesses. And these are trends that are turning up in cities from coast to coast. Witnesses and victims everywhere are afraid. But here, one man is refusing to scare. In the fall of 1983, James Hawkins, 72, is fighting off attacks by an armed gang. On page one, his story reads like a heroic stand for law and order. In real life, his motives are more complex, and he is backed by six sons with guns. The story is anything but typical, but it offers all of us a look into a kind of threat that is striking closer and closer to home. They had me. They had me every way they can, but I'm going to stay here. When I leave here, I leave here in a box, just like I told you. <laughs> and everybody over there on the counter. Now, are they going to run me away from here? No way. Yeah, when I leave, I leave here in a box. This one brave man who dared to stand up and say to the police department, I'm not going to move anywhere. This is my home. This is where I deserve to be. We're not going to tolerate it. And the community is outraged. They attempted to ram a car here in the yard, so... I was standing out here with a 351 Winchester, and, uh, and they shot twice, hit the house with a shotgun, right? So I opened fire on the car, shot the tires out, and the car swayed out to the left, right? I was saying for Sunday night when they initially assaulted the premise, but Monday and Tuesday night I was confined on the charge of murder. Murder. A gang claims that James Hawkins Jr. killed one of its members. The trouble began when Hawkins Sr. interrupted a robbery by gang members. James Jr. came to his father's aid. In a struggle that ensued, James Jr. says that a gang member pulled a gun which went off, mortally wounding the boy. It happened in front of the video arcade next to the store. The Hawkins house and store have become the targets of shooting attacks launched across Imperial Boulevard from the Nickerson Gardens housing project, where the bounty hunters gang hangs out. 
From James Hawkins' home and garage, he and his sons have returned fire and repelled three mass attacks. The police have declared that it is impossible to protect Hawkins. But today, that changes. Mayor Bradley is here to commit to Hawkins' defense the most sophisticated anti-gang system in the country. This city and county will not tolerate that kind of activity and will not stand silently by and tell people to move out. Uh, people we're asking to move out are the hoodlums. If we have to commit the entire Los Angeles Police Department to protect this brave man and his family here, we shall do it. Mayor Bradley has directed, and an order to protect Hawkins goes to the police anti-gang division. Created three years ago, along with a similar division of county sheriffs, it faces the biggest gang problem in the United States. Mapped out, the territory claimed by more than 400 gangs covers half of urban Los Angeles. The division is headed by Lieutenant Bob Rukoff. In Los Angeles, because they're, the gangs are so widespread, they're, they're located in virtually every community in the city. The emphasis has shifted away from one gang fighting another to gangs versus some innocent citizen who just happens to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. There's been a lot more shooting and innocent people are being killed. Where the real difficulty lies is finding a citizen who will even tell us what he saw, much less go to court and, and be sitting there facing the suspect and saying what he saw. Convicting gangs in court has proven so difficult that an anti-gang unit has been set up in the district attorney's office by James Baskew. Seventeen special prosecutors going after convictions through new uses of conspiracy laws. It used to be gang on gang. Now anyone can be fair gang for gang violence. In the Hawkins case, we're talking about violent crime. And the conspiracy law means that anyone who, who participated with a joint state of mind who did an overt act can be prosecuted for, you know, the acts of one. Now, what we're able to do with it in court uh, is yet to be answered. I think Mr. Hawkins is a uh, very bold individual. If we have to put a squad of guys down there, every day and that's what we'll do because we got the biggest gang in the city and we're not a big police department but i got 6800 policemen out there to back me up and uh, there's no other street gang in town that big for lieutenant rukoff it is rare to run into a hawkins it's more commonplace to come upon a store owner who has been less successful in protecting himself you don't get photographers out for robberies, so undoubtedly there's been a murder in that store. That is correct. What is this? Well, they only shot the old man, they didn't shoot the old lady. The guy that was shot and killed had on a bulletproof vest and was wearing a gun and a, and a holster on his hip. That's just your typical mom and pop market and pop is uh pop is wearing a bulletproof vest and carrying a gun in his hip to protect his store and, and that kind of somebody taking those kinds of steps to protect his stores is a pretty good indication of just how he perceives the danger to be and apparently his perceptions were pretty damn accurate because now he's dead Every store owner in Los Angeles knows what can happen and understands the risks James Hawkins runs by standing up to the gang. Between the house and store is a garage area used by Hawkins and his sons as a bunker to defend against attacks launched across Imperial Boulevard from Nickerson Gardens. Police crash units and sheriff's OSS units are trying to protect Hawkins and arrest the attackers. In about five minutes. Is that a copy this is Treetops, a former gang member who is able to talk to both gang members and the Hawkins. He works for Youth Gang Services, part of Los Angeles County's effort to talk to and mediate among gangs. Treetops has gone into Nickerson Gardens and tried to cool down the gang members. Mr. Hawkins' son blew away one of the gang members, you know, helping someone. Okay, now, to the gang members, that's a no-no. You don't blow away nobody. 
unless you have, you know, for what? They, the bottom line is they are going to not be satisfied until they get somebody from the Hawkins family. Uh, uh, okay. Okay. And, and we don't want to go all the way out and see you. Just let them go. Hey, kind of hot. This know. gang activity. Police just came over here and was telling us they going to try to set us up. Yeah, That's yeah. what he was just out there telling yeah. us. Yeah. Uh, it's not wise to... We can't jeopardize ourselves and yeah. keep tripping with them in a sense. Right? Yeah. We just, it just can't do it. What, what, what was he telling them? Yeah. They're going to use girls to try to spy. They're going to use the little kids to try to spy. we got to watch the kids. we got to watch some the kids. Have we are not yeah. to have our, none of our little kids out, out there. That's what they're saying. They just want a yeah. dead hawk. They want any, yeah. any of us dead. Don't fool with the girls or the kids anymore. I mean, hey, if they're coming to buy something, let them do it. But watch them like you would watch the grown up. No difference watch the little kids with the firearms because that's what they plan on trying to do it to you. James Hawkins has always been a model for his sons to live up to. He set one example for his family just six months before the current trouble. He was held up by a woman and man. Hawkins gave them his money, but he had a gun nearby. I keep my gun up over the cash register. So I grabbed my gun and ran to the door and hollered, halt, halt, come back, halt. And they turned around and went to shooting at me. Yeah, they turned around, both of them went to shooting at me. So I blazed it right in the face. I think I hit her right here. I knocked all that loose. Knocked out, she fell out there, money and everything, drinks and everything. I'd have got him if he'd stayed over here. But he, see, he's right against the law, that's state highway, he can't shoot across the street. You know, so I can understand why mom and dad have constantly stayed here. We were raised here. I mean, this, these are the roots. The roots is right here. So if he's, if he's going to toughen it out, that's what we're all about. We have to do the same. Well, see, it's 72 grandchildren. This is just a few of them here. Not only do they rob old women, young women, uh, little kids, <laughs> anybody that looks like they have something to be taken, you know, they'll get you, right? So I say, hey, that could be my wife, my sister, my mother, right? I mean, they don't have any discretion on who they're robbing, you know. So how can you say that, uh, well, I just better, you know, look the other way. I better not, better not do anything because that could be you one day, right? Wait till we relax and come over here and just uh, got to stay on our assassinate God. us. Yeah, we got to stay on our God. I never, but I'm not going to leave you. I'm going to let them know somebody got to stand up. So you have to stand somewhere or you fall apart, right? And, and I think that's the situation that happened with my brother. He just got tired of it, and he decided to uh, take a stand at that moment. James Jr. saw his father at the corner of Slater Street trying to stop two alleged members of the Bounty Hunters gang who were attempting to rob a woman and three children on Imperial Boulevard. He ran to his father's aid. The woman and children were able to leave. Then one of the suspects, Tony, entered the video arcade. James Jr. tried to eject Tony. A gun went off. Tony, wounded, ran back across Imperial Boulevard and died in the project. If I had a pistol myself on me, I'm quite sure I could have outdrawn him and in the barrel of my gun, he probably would have stopped drawing, he would be alive today. But I didn't have no pistol on me, I was unarmed, so I went to him instead. And the struggle ensued and boom, and went off and he later died from his own wound, inflicted by himself in a sense. It was for lack of evidence to prosecute that the district attorney's office released James Jr. and that further enraged gang members. You do not kill a blood and expect to have no retaliation. They are going to come back, bottom line. They can stand on top of the roof, man. They can drive by. You know, the Hawkins are always leaving. You know, the bottom line is they are not going to be satisfied until one of the Hawkins is pushing up daisies because the bounty hunter is pushing daisies because of one of them. You know, it's, hey man, it's just a matter of time before they catch one of them slipping. And when they catch one of the Hawkins slipping by themselves, they're going to burn it.
first night when they came to get the revenge, it was Sunday night, it was about 25, 30 of them. And so when I seen them coming across the street with gas bombs, I say, hey, these guys are going to burn us up. You know what I mean? <laughs> so uh, uh, I opened fire on their head. I could have probably killed maybe about eight or nine of them, you know, but I didn't have the malice in my heart that they probably had in theirs. I heard the shooting and um, I, I started screaming and I, I really thought I was the last one to, to be killed. I thought if everybody got here was dead. Can you... I tried to blast them point blank. I didn't yeah. care because I seen what they was trying to do. They were shooting not up, they were shooting discriminately straight at us. They was throwing the Elton, if you wouldn't have let that, you'd think like daddy and mama thing. And you were shooting the Hawkins have fought off three mass attacks. The first a few hours after the wounded gang member died two more the next night. Since then, James Jr. has been shot at and his house firebombed. He'll take his turn guarding his father tonight, which will leave his home unprotected. The next morning, the home of James Hawkins Jr. still smolders from an attack that came while his wife and son slept. It was just a nightmare, that's all. Uh... And I took my kids to my mom's house, and I came back and stayed with the neighbor. I went to be as close as I can to this house. You know, then I lose totally everything. And this is it. This is just what happened. Well, they don't know the challenge I'd like to give them, and if it comes to that, I'm going to give them that soon. And all they, the only thing they really do respect is uh, the barrel of a gun. And superior firepower, I can recruit necessary, you know, to go in there and do that. But that'd be contrary to law and order. Even the forces of law and order try to be careful entering Nickerson Gardens. It looks like a garden, but it has the crime rate of a ghetto terrorized by gangs who are out of control. We're in Nickerson Gardens here. This is all uh, bounty hunter territory. We spent a lot of time down here in, in great numbers. Uh, not a real good place for one unit to stop and do any chit-chatting. You generally need another unit to kind of back up against a wall and keep an eye on you so you don't get nailed. Well, I'm not going to drive too slow through here because we offer a pretty tempting target. Even Treetops chooses his time to go into Nickerson Gardens. See, if you're a street person, you know when to go in there and when not to go in there. If your vibes tell you to go, you go. If your vibes tell you to lay back, hey, man, you got to be cool. Because you go off in there against your vibes and they, and they shermed out, you did. When we wanted to talk to people in Nickerson Gardens, Treetops handed us off to another youth gang services worker, Gary Barner, who grew up here. He put out the word. Volunteers showed up to talk to us, their gang affiliations, if any, undefined. Mrs. Thomas is the mother of Antoine Thomas, Tony, the boy who was shot and wounded in the scuffle with James Jr. and later died. From what I heard, that my son was shot for nothing. He was killed. And they're going to say that my son had a gun. Now, there are witnesses which the news media didn't ask no one over here what happened. They have a lot of gangs, uh, they call gang members, young men and young women in jail. They never came over here and asked them anything. They went straight to the Hawkins, asked them. This hurts them over here because hear their side. Let them tell you what happened. It's Hawkins and the gang member. It's not Hawkins and the gang member. It's Hawkins and the community, yeah. what it really is. But what the paper writes says, the gang members, you know, but it's the community. Ain't not all of us right here, you know, it's a lot like I work, he work, a lot of us work, you know. Yeah. And they tell them the story totally backwards, like they're a hero family, yeah. which is, I don't blame them for trying to stop somebody from robbing somebody, but when you got somebody in the grasp already, you ain't got to blow them away right yeah, then and there. Like yeah, they they had it. But my son said he was shot for nothing. And my son don't lie to me, because I know my son. He loved a baby, and I know how he was. But my son was murdered. And every child that comes down in Pura right now is going to get shot at random, because someone over there is jittery. And that's not fair. And I didn't come here to cry, because it's not going to bring my son back. And then they're going to shot someone else. 
Another boy was shot when James Jr. spotted a figure in the dark from his camper parked behind his father's house. He was in a position to shoot in the house at a tall something, stick his hand close enough. He's close enough to the bars. So there's some bars, there's security bars in the rear. He's close enough to jam something through the window. And I wasn't about to take any chances, but I did fire two warning shots, and he made a threatening uh, gesture when he spun around rather than stand in the same position as I told him to, and I shot him in the heel. Once again, James Jr. was taken into custody. This shooting was investigated by the district attorney's office, and he was released. See, they're trying to build it up like they're a big hero-like family, and we fighting this gang people, and they're not going to make us move. We don't want to make them move. All we want them to do is stop killing people, you know. He have a license to kill. Human exterminator. This shooting about here is bringing about a situation as to whether I am trigger-happy or whether the shooting is this there, should I just uh, uh, obey my father, you know, desert my father. I can't do that. Mr. Hawkins was a police officer. He was an L.A. County sheriff, right? He was with the sheriff's department. So when they do something, it's not, it's considered he's still a police. In their eyes, he's still a police officer, see? His father was once a special deputy for the sheriff's department, but James Jr. is not a policeman. James Jr. wears a uniform similar to a traffic policeman to help him direct traffic, his job in one of the Hawkins family's many businesses. From this tiny store, James Hawkins Sr. and his family have branched out into a network of businesses that have brought the family obvious success. James Sr. often sits here in his roles, enjoying the place where he's built his businesses. This old building houses the store, video arcade, a barber shop. On a corner opposite Nickerson Gardens, Hawkins' son Otis runs a vegetable stand. Farmer Otis grows his own spinach and collards and sweet potatoes in surrounding fields. In another community, Daughter Maddie owns a liquor store. She would like to see her father give up the store he loves and move away. He could come with me. He has several children. We've all extended our homes to our parents. We would just love to have them with us. I would love it. And Maddie has plenty of room. I got a case that a family wants a funeral service immediately. I mean, they want a rush service for Saturday. Elton and James wear the uniforms required for escorting funerals. One of the services provided by the family business which does embalming for mortuaries. It is run by Eugene. By chance, he received the body of Antoine Thomas. It was not a small caliber gun. It was a saw. It was a shotgun. It was a close range, and his upper shoulder was completely just torn away. So it was both barrels, evidently both barrels was discharged, had to be. And when they put on the, he died from massive hemorrhage. It was quite a bit of damage done to the boy. I'm surprised he was able to, to live as long as he did with uh, arteries being shattered. I mean, he was getting no, he lost so, such a large amount of blood because 
when we did the embalming, we didn't get any blood from him basically at all. I appreciate my father standing up for his belief, but I think it's very uh, not right to do that. Very stupid, to be honest about it, because I know life is much more than a fight. You should run to fight again another day. Dead folks, he's not gonna bother you, you, you know. I don't, I, I feel better with them than I feel with live folks because I know I, I have nothing to fear. It's the live people that do the damage to you. And a lot of time the kids come in the store hungry. Mr. August, I ain't got a thing. Would you give me, I, I feed them a lot of time. I just take pit and feed the little kids. I do it quite often. Oh, I see so much going on, it just makes you, makes you feel bad, it certainly do. In Nickerson Gardens, a great many of the adults are mothers, poor, trying to raise their families without the help of fathers. Mrs. Willis is not on welfare, as many others here are. She fears the influence of the gangs on her son, Louis Williams. I did not want to move in here, but I didn't have a choice, see. And first of all, my cousin had my kids, and then they were in a foster home. So they were going to send my children to my mother. And that was a no-no. I wouldn't put my children on with my mother. I would not do that. So I got out of the hospital and come home for one purpose, and that was to raise my kids. I lost my home out in Compton at, uh, on Magnolia. And all this traumatic every, and everything and trying to go to school and take care of seven kids. You know, go to school in the daytime and college at night. I was doing it. I really was. Mrs. Willis' son, Louis Williams, is now 17. He's been arrested twice before, and now he knows that the police are looking for him in connection with the Hawkins affair. The, the newspaper printed it that the gun came from over in the projects, came from over here, and it ended up in a tussle with Hawkins' son and Tony, but it wasn't like it's that. He didn't have no gun, he, he had, had no he knife. They were playing they the game the when they shot him. They snatched him out the arcade and shot him right there. Shot him. Shot him. Shot him. Lot of holes mm -hmm. in what it looked like him walking across the middle of Imperial with a shotgun, running, going shot. to an arcade yeah, to play to play the arcade. What that looked like, he walking across the street with a shotgun, you know, in broad daylight. Why would he let him? In? Well, see, when you speak of a shotgun, you're not speaking about a long shotgun, okay? You're speaking about a shotgun, all right? You're just speaking about a shotgun that you can stick right here and pull out, you know, and shoot two times. You know, you're talking about a sawed-off. Well, we're trying. Yeah, we got yeah, 24 names we're trying to put away. Yeah, see, we got a The police and sheriff's anti-gang units make it their business to know the gangs and their members. Now they are setting out to round up the bounty hunters suspected of attacking the Hawkins. Guys requesting a black and white coach. Like I said, we know who the guy is, so we know who we're looking for. Your yes, man is right back there with the black jacket walking. Okay, hopefully he won't run because he thinks he's cool. A male Negro wearing a black jacket, a black hat, dark pants. Uh, last name is Williams. He might not know he's wanted. He, he could have just split because he might have had a gun on him or had some dope on him or something. We're on 5 2 place. You got your light right on us right now. He 
D.C. they got most of them, they got about 15, 20 of them in jail. Right. Yeah, that's, 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 that's a lot of pressure off us. Then I decided, well, I'm going to turn my son in. And I carried him out to the Linwood police, and I turned him in myself. And I proceeded to tell them that he's in good health, and if you jump on him or beat him up, I'm going to sue you. Mrs. Willis has turned her son, Louie, into the county sheriffs. Special prosecutors of the district attorney's hardcore division are preparing a case against Louie Williams and other suspects based on conspiracy law. But before they can bring the charge against the 14 defendants in a trial, they must convince a judge in a pretrial hearing that they have reasonable evidence that a conspiracy existed. of prosecuting these defendants, Assistant District Attorney Fred Horn. Mrs. Willis's son, Louis, is a juvenile, but he is being tried as an adult, and his greatest fear is that he will be locked up with adults. He said, you know, he said, well, Mama, God answered my prayer, at least I'm not going to the jail, even though I'm going to another juvenile. He says, I'm not going down there to that jailhouse. In undertaking to prosecute 14 defendants at once, Horn must face 14 defense attorneys. But behind Horn is the hardcore division and its approach to conspiracy law. See, gang cases are very difficult. Gangs are group crimes. Very difficult to use the old one-on-one, -on -one, the car theft type of stuff. And we have a common law history that groups are more dangerous to the community than the single person. Hence, we have uh, conspiracy laws. In other words, if uh, only half of those uh, 14 people had guns and fired at the house, the other half, or the other seven, are still going to be held accountable for it because they're part of the group, part of the conspiracy. They're all going to be off the street for, I think, a period of time. Some of them a long period of time. So uh, they're going to get, I think, substantial prison terms, even the, the youthful offenders. The whole prison, nothing but the Good God. This is a high security courtroom with bulletproof glass and armed marshals. The pretrial hearing is a trial in itself. Three weeks of witnesses and testimony to help the judge decide, is there enough evidence that a conspiracy to attack the Hawkins existed and that these defendants participated? Evidence enough to bind them over to trial. Early in the hearing, James Hawkins was asked a key question. Could he identify any of the defendants? If you, when you thought about testifying, you looked at these kids, you believe actually all these kids were there, although you can't identify them. I can't identify them. Gang members are used to this, witnesses and victims not being able to identify them. But two witnesses are here who saw everything and are not intimidated. Hawkins' daughter, Cynthia, and his son, Elton. I was in the uh, north window of the residence on the garage of the of the resident there, and uh, Who else was uh, Cynthia was there at the window. I had a pair of uh, 1050 luminous field binoculars in my possession, mm -hmm. and I, I was looking out of the uh, across the street into the project area, and I I uh, I observed uh, suspect number two. Right, do you know this person? Yes, I do. Have you seen him before? Yes, I have. From where the neighborhood? Yes, uh, several times. Out of that group, did you recognize any other people? Yes, I did. Who was that? I recognized number five. He was one of the guys that was with them. Is that you, Mr. John Spitzer? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, one of them sparked approximately three rounds off. I then... Uh, uh, did you see, let me ask you this, did you see the, a person firing a gun? Suspect number one. Okay. Mr. Horton? Right. 
Two bullet holes came through this window, hitting the uh, inner wall inside the resident in the bathroom there. Bullets ricocheted and uh, landed in the bathtub. And uh, the officer here is pointing to a bullet hole that hit the top of the uh, store there. Bullet holes in that also? Bullet holes in that also. So after you heard the, these 40 some shots Monday night, uh -huh. you, you said you ducked down, you stay on the roof? Uh, I came off the roof when I heard the shotgun blast. Early on, the defense attorneys tried to discredit the Hawkins family testimony by attacking the credibility of James Jr. How much of the barrel protruded beyond the end of your hand? Well, I had around, my hand was around the muzzle and the, the beginning of the barrel. It was a very short gun. So your hand wasn't it, over the, the opening in the barrel? Uh, by, no, no, by no means was it over the, the muzzle, no sir. Did your hand completely uh, envelop the uh, I was holding the barrel, barrel, to my knowledge. I remember holding the barrel. Are you left-handed or right-handed? I'm right-handed, sir. <clears throat> Which hand did you hold the barrel with? I remember holding it with my left hand, I believe, sir. Your Honor, do you mind if I do a demonstration? Yes, sir. I don't mind. Okay, may I have Mr. Ray Newman assist me, Your Honor? Yes, sir. Thank you. Well, now, did he pull it? You said you had your hand on the barrel, didn't you? Oh, yes, I did. All right, why don't you use that newspaper as a barrel? Okay, and I just, uh, when I went to him, we started struggling with him. You grabbed his hand? Yes, sir. yes, we did. Did he pull it out or you pull it out? No, he pulled the gun out. I'm his club and trying to protect my life, buddy. All right, now you've got your left hand yes, on sir. his hand? Yes, I do. And your right hand is on the barrel? On the barrel, it is, correct. Okay, and you have the gun raised up to about his chin left? Right here. We were scrubbing, you know? Uh -huh. and I don't knock, don't knock Ray over. He's not this. No, I realize it. We scrubbed him okay. trying to take it away from you, know? And I don't know if it's hand here, but apparently, you know, at one point he was trying to push off and right around him, this when the gun went boom, you know? You had a hold of the barrel with your right hand. Do you remember testifying the fact that uh, you had the left hand on the barrel of the gun? Yes, sir, I did. Yes, sir, and I did. When, uh, when you had the demonstration out here, you had your right hand on the barrel of the gun. Is yes, that sir. right? Yes, now, do you want to change your testimony, Mr. No, no, Hawkins? I don't want to change it. Which hand was it, Mr. Hawkins? It was one of my hands on the barrel. It was one of your hands, but yes, you don't sir. know which one. Is that right? Isn't it true that you then went to your motor home and you got out a shotgun? No, sir, I didn't. And you brought that shotgun back to the arcade? No, sir, I did not. And you told those little kids, now run your mouth now. <laughs> I told them, no, sir. You didn't tell them that? Oh, of course not. No, I didn't tell Isn't them it that. true that you grabbed a young kid, Mr. Thomas, and pulled him out of the arcade? No, sir, put a shotgun to his chest and put one bullet in his chest? No, no, sir, I did that. No, sir, I did that. Isn't it true that you then ran away with the shotgun and during the 22 hour period you were hiding from the law, you got rid of the shotgun? No, sir, that is not true. Now, Mr. Hawkins, you, uh, you seem to be quite an expert in arms, as uh, you indicated. Um, when somebody shot with a shotgun, which way do they go, forward or backward? Well, uh, if someone is shot, I couldn't answer that, you know. Cause I'm not an expert on uh, shooting people. You've uh, you've used a shotgun in a robbery before, haven't you? I've never shot anyone, sir. Never shot anyone. No, sir. Never shot anyone in a robbery. But there had been robberies by James Jr. with gun in hand. Let's start off. You've, you've had a conviction, a felony conviction for postal robbery. Is that right? Yes, You've had a felony conviction for bank robbery. You've had a felony conviction for possession of a sawed-off shotgun. You've had a felony conviction for uh, escape. Okay. Now, what other felony convictions have you had? Oh, just for being unresponsive, Your Honor. That's important to record. What <laughs> and so this mother knows a fear for her son that this father has known for his son many times. I feel like that as a mother, that somewhere, somehow, um, I miss the mark just a little bit. I mean, you know, not that I'm saying that all it is my fault. It is not all the fault of Mrs. Willis or of this city, because across the country, more young gang members are doing violence to citizens without qualm. It seems to be a breakdown of humanity in the name of belonging to a gang. Belonging where other belongings, to communities, to church, families, have ceased to exist. 
But even belonging to a family with a strong father present did not keep James Jr. from joining in the violence around him. My mother and father was very close in church, and we were raised up in church. And we was always taught to do the right thing. Yeah, we was always taught to do the right thing. Don't lie, tell the truth, and us would always win. And that's the way we always, that's the way I was brought, I brought all my, raised up my 14 kids. You can love them so much, so rather than bring what you intend to come out, you can almost smother that. You know what I'm saying? You bring, you, in, in other words, bringing out the good sometimes, you bring out the odds. It. And then with him not, with his father and I not being together, he said to me, Mama, who do I look up to? Louie's sister brings her daughter to see her Uncle Louie. position where they're going to have to bear some uh, criminal responsibility. Is that right? I would know. For a gang member to testify against fellow gang members is to risk violent retribution. The district attorney has offered to relocate this witness, Benny Carr, in a secret location. Louis finds out that the next witness is a deputy who is about to read from a statement Louis gave the sheriffs. Okay, he saw a snoop. D-Boy, Renzi, Dale, T-Bone, Plucky, Birdman Greg, Bob. Once before, Louis felt the anger of the gang after he gave information to the police. After he told them about the guys that did it, uh, he came in one or two times. He had cigarette burns on his back. And then another time I had to rush outside and they were caught trying to make him, you know, uh, suck their what's the name, you know. But Louis wasn't the only defendant to give a statement. So did Curtis Johnson. Someone in the group said, no, nah, they've killed, they've already killed two people already and nobody's done anything about it. Let's go over there and shoot up the whole family. Said Renzi had a shotgun, he had a 38, Bob had a 32 semi auto, Wee Wee had a 25 semi auto, Imp had a 22 caliber machine gun, Hilltop had a 30 30 rifle. Malcolm Horton also gave a statement to the sheriffs. He heard the machine gun go off, and then everybody started firing. 
Uh, he fired twice and then was shot in the buttocks by someone behind him. So did Lorenzo Foreman, Bobby Brooks, Wallace Harris. Judge Mel Ricagna has heard descriptions of attacks on the Hawkins and efforts by the defense to suggest that James Jr. murdered Antoine Thomas. Now he orders cameras not to photograph a surprise witness for the defense, a passerby at the time of the shooting who does not know the Hawkins family. He claims he saw an older man shoot a younger man. Uh, he went into the back trailer and took out a shotgun. Could you describe the shotgun for It seemed to be uh, illegal, sawed off. When the younger guy pushed away, like trying to break away, the gentleman reversed the angle of the shotgun and cornered it like in a slanting position and it pressed up against the chest. What, uh, what did you see then? The gun went off. Whether or not James Jr. shot Antoine Thomas is legally irrelevant to the charges in this hearing, that a group conspired to and did attack the Hawkins family. Prosecutor Horn presses forward with his arguments that a conspiracy did exist. As far as the establishing of a conspiracy goes, Your Honor, each and every witness that counsel mentioned, contrast to what counsel says in the not establishing a conspiracy, does just the opposite. The conduct of all the parties involved is what establishes the conspiracy, as in any other conspiracy. Granted, you must have the intent to agree and the intent to do the act. The intent in this case, like in most any other cases, as the court is well aware, I'm sure, where the intent is proven by the conduct of the individual. I don't agree with counsel. The fact that people are standing across the street from a house and shooting at it doesn't mean that uh, anybody's agreed to do that. There's a conspiracy is proven by conduct. When you have a group of people that get together, several of them with guns and several of them with bottles with rags out of them, with liquid inside, and going across the street with a, a flare, it's clear that they aren't going over just to go trick-or-treating or something. In the end, each of the 14 court-appointed attorneys for the defense tried to tell the court why his client should not be considered a member of a conspiracy. The attorney for Louis Williams is Victor Marin. The only evidence that uh, I heard that uh, could be argued uh, to tie Mr. Williams into this was uh, saying that he gave to uh, Deputy Castillo, Deputy Castillo testified that there was no arrest warrant for him. Mr. Williams, Mr. Williams turned himself in. Uh, in conclusion, I don't uh, see that they presented enough evidence to tie Mr. Williams into the conspiracy. And Lewis said he didn't know where the gun's coming from. And then he said he did pick up a gun. But then he gave it back to one of the guys, but what, the, what they got him for was that he went on around there with him. I believe this defendant in his statement also admitted to picking up a gun and starting across the street with the gun, not completing that, but handing the gun to somebody else was his own admission. I think that the person who tells the other guy to shoot the gun or drives the car or sets the other person up is just as culpable. And so in years past, they may have just gone after the shooter, or we started prosecuting everybody in the gang and making them equally culpable. The inference is that their intent is to do what? To do harm. That's the, clearly the evidence that's stated by some of these individuals. We're going to get the Hawkinses, we're going to shoot them, gonna we're going to burn them. Because each of those statements that were offered were offered to the declaring only. And that evidence is not in... Prosecutor Horn argued that the testimony of Benny Carr and the statements of the defendants themselves proved a conspiracy. William Moore, Louis Williams, Terry McMurray, guilty thereof by order that... The judge ruled that for 13 of the 14 defendants, all except Albert Thornton, enough evidence existed to bind them over for trial, evidence that they did conspire and attack the Hawkins. Uh, the offense of... Uh... Shooting at an inhabited dwelling, I believe, carries, uh, I think it's also 16, two or three years, the range of uh, time that the judge can give an individual in prison. 
I made a factual finding that, in fact, based on the evidence presented, that, in fact, there was a conspiracy. And after I made that factual finding, then I stated as to count one, which is the conspiracy itself, I held everybody to answer except for one defendant. A, a conspiracy theory, I believe, is a, a, a tremendously powerful weapon of the prosecution. I think they should use it more. Many of the major cities in the United States have a growing street, street gang problem. My uh, recommendation to other jurisdictions is don't let it get this far. I think our experience should teach that we started doing it too late, that we should have taken this all out uh, war, a coordinated approach, if you will, on gangs much earlier, and we should start doing much more with parents and schools and other social institutions at a very early age to stop it in its tracks. With the exception of our murder rate, which I'm a little distressed over because it's starting to creep back up, gang crime is still down over where it was last year at this time, which was down over the previous year. So we're still doing a good job. A few weeks after the pretrial hearing, someone firebombed the Hawkins mortuary and burned more than 30 bodies. They pulled out about 10 or 15 of them, just laid them all over the floor, like they meant to inform you that uh, we mean to do damage to you. Not only did they steal everything, you know, that they put their hands on, why burn up dead bodies who are dead is stupidity. Police department informed, that's, that's a form of gangs to might to inform you that is to hate to do damage to you. A few months later, there was another arrest. James Hawkins, Jr., to face a pretrial hearing on the charge of having murdered Antoine Thomas. They are not going to be satisfied until one of the Hawkins is pushing up daisies because a bounty hunter is pushing daisies because of one of them. You know, they can outwit the police. And they are going to wait, and wait, and wait, and wait. To this father, the threat of a murder charge against his son outweighs the threat to himself by a gang. It probably always has. To this mother, the loss of her son to a gang is now outweighed by the fear of finally losing him to a prison. Did James Hawkins Jr. murder Antoine Thomas? Did the 13 defendants conspire and attack the Hawkins family? These questions, legally separate, will be decided by two different courts, but they both grow out of one decision by one man to stop a robbery. And neither would have happened if gang violence and murder had not become part of the life of the city. The community's fight against gangs has led to an increase in arrests and convictions. But police and prosecutors in major cities across the country stress that the problem goes beyond law and order. It has to do with a cycle of poverty and neglect. So all of us who are concerned must realize that solutions need to begin much earlier and need to involve communities, schools, and parents. Parents like Mrs. Willis and Mr. Hawkins. Next week on Frontline, a very special Memorial Day program. It was 10 years overdue, a welcome home for veterans of the war never won nor understood. They grew up together, they went to high school together, the Marine Corps together, and they both died together in Vietnam. One died in my arms, and, excuse me, I, uh, I knew a lot, I had a lot of friends. Yeah. You did your job, and a grateful, a grateful nation is finally coming together, and I say amen to that. I mean, it's long overdue. You betcha. We didn't move. Spread the word.
call the film Vietnam Memorial. It is next week on Frontline. I'm Judy Woodruff. For a transcript of this program, please send $4 to Frontline, Box 322, Boston, Massachusetts, 02134. Frontline is produced for the Documentary Consortium by WGBH Boston, which is solely responsible for its content. Major funding for Frontline was provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Additional funding was provided by this station and other public television stations nationwide. For video cassette information about Frontline, write to PBS Video, Box 8092, Washington, D.C., 20024. <laughs> Do you know who I am? He was known by many names on stage. Macbeth, Othello, and Hamlet. Get thee to a nunnery. Why wouldst thou be a breeder of sinners? I am myself indifferent, honest, but yet I could accuse me of such things to a better my mother had not borne me. He was the greatest actor of his generation, yet his career ended in disgrace. Did you expect a vindication of my private conduct? I am unable to satisfy you. The errors I have committed have been scanned before a public tribunal. I stand here before you as the representative of Shakespeare's heroes. Only in that field have you the right to sit in judgment upon me. Don't miss Oscar winner Ben Kingsley in this tour de force performance. Ben Kingsley as Edmund Keane. Join us Tuesday evening at 8, WDCN 8. The door to the mind. Hearing. Our means of orchestrating the voyage through life from infancy to advancing age. When something goes wrong with that incredibly complex mechanism we call the ear, an isolation chamber is being built, cutting us off from experiencing the world as we, the hearing, know it. What happens to a person when one of their most vital sources of human communication stops working? when they lose that precious sense, hearing. A search for alternative methods of communicating should become a quest of great urgency. Often in our culture, hearing loss is ignored or only passively attended. Because hearing loss is invisible and usually painless, it is the hurt that does not show. Right here, Tuesday evening at 9, WDCN 8. WDCN 8, Nashville. This program is being made possible by a grant from the American General Nashville Life Companies, the National Life and Accident Insurance Company, and Life and Casualty Insurance Company of Tennessee. You are invited to this Great Performances 10th Anniversary Celebration. Great Performances is made possible by grants from Exxon, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, the National Endowment for the Arts, this station and other public television stations.